All right, here's a demonstration of another switching regulator. Let's move down a little bit. It's an LM2575T-5. It's a 5 volt output switching regulator. In the case of this circuit, I have an input of 17 volts. As you can see on the meter, it's putting out about 5. You can put in up to 60 volts, I believe, on this particular part or related parts. Let's zoom in on the actual regulator circuit itself. In this case, it's powering an Arduino Nano. That's nothing. In this case, I just have the pulse width modulation hooked up to control an LED. What is the <coughs> excuse me, what is the advantage? <coughs> excuse me. What's the advantage of this switching regulator? At 17 volts switch down to 5 volts, something like 70-75% of your energy is going to be used for nothing but heating up the voltage regulator if you use the 3 pin, say a 7805. You're burning up a lot of energy as heat. So a switching regulator is, a, is more energy efficient. Let's look at this circuit itself a little bit closer. It really consists of five parts. The regulator itself. This is a 330 microhenry coil. An output capacitor, an input capacitor, and hidden behind there, you may, a little hard to see, is a 1N5819 high-speed shot key diode. The device itself runs at 52 kilohertz and its duty cycle is varied to control the output to keep it right at 5 volts, if right close to 5 volts. Um, it has 5 pins. It takes the voltage and the feedback. It has 5 pins. It has an input, output, feedback, on, off, and ground. You often ground the on, off just to leave it on. It can be switched on and off with a microcontroller if necessary. So it's a very simple, highly efficient switching regulator. It's cheap. I think I got 10 of them for $2. Uh, the capac capacitors were dirt cheap. No, well, eBay tends to be that way. Again, this is, this is highly efficient. Now, if we had a situation where, for instance, I needed 5 volts and it was 9 volts or less that I'm inputting, use your 7805s, your simple 3-pin regulators, use them. But if you're getting a wide voltage input to a low voltage, you really need to go to these. I'll explain in the schematic what you have to look out for when you build these type circuits. Pictured here is a basic 5 volt switching regulator configuration. This is known as a buck. It's a variation of what I had in the video. All of these switching regulators have at least one catch diode, which has to be a high-speed shot key, an inductor, and an output capacitor. What you're doing by switching energy into this inductor is you're essentially charging up a capacitor. Here I'm only interested in configurations, and we're going to discuss how these three components work with a transistor switch. Here's a simplified configuration of the above circuit. I have an unregulated DC in and I have a switching transistor which is switched on and off with a pulse width modulation signal. When I switch T1 on current will flow through L1. Some of it will start to charge C1, but most of it is going to be absorbed by the inductor as it creates a surrounding magnetic field. Note the polarity of the inductor at this point. 
D1, our catch diode, is turned off. And the output voltage at this point is very low. At this point now, I have turned T1 off. The magnetic field that was induced in L1 collapses. When it collapses, it induces a voltage of the opposite polarity of that that created it. That's basic inductors. Note the polarity on L1 now has been reversed. This time now, D1 will turn on and the energy is transferred from L1 through D1 to charge up C1. The voltage output is largely the duty cycle of the pulse width modulation input times the input peak input, input voltage. Now we're looking at a different configuration called a buck boost. Note how I've changed the positions of D1 and L1. When T1 is turned on, current will flow through L1 through T1 to ground. Once again, as it and no and really very little or nothing is transferred to C1. Note that the polarity on L1 as the magnetic field is created. Now I've turned off T1 and the magnetic field that was generated in L1 when it was turned on collapses. This induces a voltage of the opposite polarity. You notice the polarity now on L1 has reversed. But you notice that I'm going from plus, minus, to plus. The induced voltage in L1 adds to the input voltage and through D1 is used to charge the capacitor C1. This is why we call it a buck boost. The output voltage is higher now than the input voltage. Now we come to our third basic configuration known as buck boost inverting. Note how I've changed the positions of L1, D1, T1, and you noticed I've turned polarity-wise the capacitor upside down. When I switch T1 on, current flows through T1 through L1 to ground. Again, this induces a magnetic field surrounding L1. D1 at this point, the diode is turned off. All right, this time I have turned T1 off and no more current flows through T1. The magnetic field across L1 has collapsed, inducing a output polarity opposite again to that that created it. This will allow D1 to conduct, and thus I'm charging up C1 through D1 during the off cycle. And you notice that my output polarity is opposite of my input polarity. In addition, depending on the value of L1 and other factors, the output voltage can not only be inverted, it could be a higher voltage. So that completes this quick look at switching voltage regulator configurations. Um, visit my website at www.bristolwatch.com. This is part of a several part series on building and using switching voltage regulators. Thanks for listening.